Hey friends, how you doing wherever you are at today? Today is Thursday the 13th of April and Jesus truly is Lord. Hey, sending out greetings uh, from France. Today I'm in France. I left uh, the US on Monday, flew into Dublin, spent most of the day sitting around Dublin up, but actually flew into Lyon, France late Tuesday and got a blah blah car. If you don't know what a blah blah car is, <laughs> don't ask. <laughs> Uh, to Saint Etienne, my wife Leah picked me up there and I was in a bit of a daze yesterday recovering and today's Thursday and uh, I am in my office here in France up and running and uh, looking forward to uh, some time here with Leah and Dylan. It's Leah's birthday on Saturday so uh, please send Leah your birthday wishes. She is 21 on Saturday. Something like that. Uh, hey, uh, for any friends in France, I'm going to be preaching. Uh, je vais prêcher ce dimanche au Chambon sur Lignon. So I'll be preaching here in Chambon sur Lignon Sunday morning in the Evangelical Church here. Monday, I will be in the city of Lyon. And uh, Tuesday morning, I take the train up to Lille in France. And I'm going to be speaking Tuesday evening in Tournai in Western Belgium. And then on Wednesday, I'll be in Verviers, right on the far side of Belgium, Eastern Belgium, and flying out of Brussels on Thursday back to the U.S. of A. So, those are my things there. Uh, a few quick things as well. I've got a bunch of media coming out. I've just had a new series started this week, all about freedom, for 12 videos about the freedom that is ours in Christ Jesus. And it's a glorious freedom. And I, I really talk in detail about how, to, how we have a standing and identity, like a, like a citizenship. Like when you become a citizen, you, you immediately get all the benefits of that uh, kingdom, that citizenship. Um, but then you've got to learn to live them out in different areas. And I go through freedom in many different areas of our life, freedom from legalism, freedom from fear, freedom from habits, freedom from sin and shame, lots of different things. Check that out, it's coming out every day on YouTube. And if you're interested, we can we have the whole download, all 12 videos, 12 audios. My sermon notes <clears throat> are available for a donation of $20 or whatever you can afford that goes to support our mission's work. Uh, so check that out as well there. Drink some good French water here. Um, what else is going on? I'll be in my churches in New England next week. Hey, in the month of um, May, I'll be taking a team to the nation of Ireland. We'll be staying in Northern Ireland and doing revival services, doing a conference there in the city of Newry. If you're interested in joining our team, uh, still a possibility to have one or two more people come. Just drop me a line if you're interested and I can discuss that with you in private. There isn't a public sign up anymore, but if you're interested, let me know. Lots more things on my website, and I'm redesigning my website, uh, so check that out there. Hey, let me share something with you real quick, and I've been thinking about this the last few days, and uh, let me ask you a question. What is your revelation of worship? I think, think that's three for a sec. What is your revelation of worship? It's interesting, as I look back at my, you know, for me, what's about 35 years of Christianity, and also, frankly, being a pastor and both being a worship leader or a worship leader is, in one sense, any pastor is any pastor wants to help a congregation move into worship. I've come to the conclusion that many, many people are at different levels of worship. But um, but um, that's a big revelation, I know. But I actually think it's hard in worship to move past your current revelation. And... I just I want to get you thinking about this just for a sec. Where are you at this place of revelation? What's your revelation of God? I think so often our worship life isn't determined by the style of church we're in or, you know, how free or not free or whatever label we might want to put that. But it's really what's going on in our heart. You know, there's an interesting thing. I, I was sharing a message a few weeks ago <clears throat> in one of my churches, really talking about offering, actually, about financial offering. And I quoted the passage where, I believe it's in Deuteronomy, where Moses says to the people of Israel, track with me here, follow this. He says, when you go into the promised land, do not fear the gods. And in a way, the principle is, if you, if you start to fear the gods, you'll end up worshipping them. Now, that's true of the idols in Israel. I was actually making the point it's true of money, that if we fear, 
if we have a fear relationship with money or the lack of money, we're really, we turn it into an idol. We always end up worshiping the thing we fear. If you're taking notes, write that down today. You'll always end up worshiping the thing you fear. That's why the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And and in a very great sense, our relationship with God starts with the fear of the Lord. Now, I know some religious people, to me, the religious people aren't those who go, oh, we don't have to fear, you know. I get it, we don't have to fear God, but the awesomeness of God, the awe, the thing where the angels fly around his throne crying, holy, holy, holy. They're not living in fear. They're not thinking, God's about to snuff me out. God's about to turn me off or whatever, but the the awesomeness of God. And at one sense, you don't get born again because you'd like to improve your life. You don't get born again because you think it's a good idea one Tuesday. You get born again. What does the old hymn say? "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and then grace my fears relieved." Without the grace of God, we don't even see we need God. And then it's that very grace which takes that fear away. And it's really important that if we, if we bypass or we minimize that, I just, I'm going to call it the fear of God because that's Bible language, but the awesomeness of God, the holiness of God, the other of God, the greatness, that there, there, it should be that legitimate, the fear of God in our life, no matter how long we walk with him, no matter how intimate we are with him and worship is about intimacy as well. But there should be that thing in us that is the, that sees that. And to the measure that we see that, to that measure, we will plunge into the depths of worship. And it's interesting, I, I've, I've been thinking about this, looking at different people recently. I think <clears throat> people often project upon the canvas of worship, the revelation, or not, that they have of God. That's why people get bored in worship. That's why some people turn off in worship. I think at times, I've been in church circles where they say, you know, a few songs at the beginning is good to warm us up, but the preaching, the word is the main thing. Now, I go, amen, the word is the main thing. I don't, I just don't, for me, it's both and, not either or. When we're worshiping, we're engaging in Jesus, the living word by his spirit. And then we're preaching the written word with the anointing on becomes him speaking to us. And you don't have to play this silly game of we've got to choose one or t'other. But at times, if we don't have a revelation of the awesomeness of God, we miss it. I think at times people's revelation is the mission of God. And yeah, worship becomes, let's sing a few songs, you know, to the ends of the earth we will go. Like, amen. But that's a missional song. It's not about God. Sometimes people's revelation of God is loving one for another, community, uh, support, love for the brethren, so to speak. And they can connect with songs that are singing about that, but they get bored when we're in that awesomeness of God. And I believe for all of us, there's not a a right or wrong. There are many different aspects of revelation, but I think the Lord wants to take us all into a journey. And really that journey, it's like the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. The book of Psalms says that we enter into his court with thanksgiving and praise. It's referring to the outer court. There's an outer court place of worship where we thank God, where we sing, look what the Lord has done. When we consider, you know, when I consider, when I, oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider the works of your hands. You know, when we look at what God has done, that's a good place to start in worship. There's an outer court experience that is more about what God has done for us and our gratefulness and thankfulness of us. There's an inner court experience that really relates more to worship. The outer court is much more about our bodies. It's where we raise our hands, clap your hands, all you people shout unto God with a voice of triumph. It's where we dance before the Lord, halal, where we worship the living God, even like with our bodies. There's an inner court place, more of intimacy, where we worship God with our soul. Praise is more about the things God has done. Worship is a lot more about who God is. When I look into your holiness, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. That's a soulish realm of worship where we are engaging our emotions with him. Usually in that soulish place in worship, it doesn't mean that your body doesn't do something, but you're more going to bow or just sitting in adoration and, wow, you're loving him. But what I think where so many of us miss this is the Spirit of the Lord wants to bring us into an inner court, to a holy of holies place. That's where the glory dwells. Adam and Eve walked in the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the, come on Baptists, the glory of God. We lost the glory 
in when we were thrown out of the garden. The glory came back into the earth, but it was locked in the Holy of Holies. And a man can only come in once a year with incense and blood, the high priest, and interact with the glory of God. And even then, you know, if you read the scriptures at times, they'd tie a rope around his ankle to pull his dead body out if he displeased God and the glory struck him dead. And now when Jesus cried out in Matthew 1930, it is finished. The, the curtain, the veil of the temple was torn, was rent from the top to the bottom, from heaven to earth. And the way, what the writer to the Hebrews talks about, the way into the holiest place was open. And I tell you, God wants, he loves all these different expressions of worship, but he wants to bring us into that place. If I can really sum it up, it's the place Jesus spoke about in Matthew, excuse me, John 19, 20. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, that you are in me and I am in you. Outer court is like a physical worship. It's about what God's done for us. Inner court is like that soulish worship, who God is to us. But the Holy of Holies is the glory place. It's spirit worship, spirit to spirit. In, there's a place in the Holy of Holies where you don't need a song. There's a place in the Holy of Holies where the wheels took themselves back up the undercarriage because they've served their purpose and they're only going to cause a drag then. There's a place where we stand in the glory of God, connected with him. And I believe that the church is getting into that place. I believe there are forerunners, Joseph's in the spirit. I believe the Lord wants to teach us to enter into that place. We're on a journey in the churches I lead in New England to, in a way, to only sing songs of glory, songs of the inner court. And it's not that we'll never sing another, but not to, we can't keep singing an inner court song and then popping back to the outer court. It's really frustrating. We've got to stand in the glory of God and the whole earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. The train of his glory will fill you and I, the temple. Hallelujah. I believe we're moving into a place you know, some people are looking for a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Well, bless you in your building activities. I believe he's raised up a temple and that's, no, you not, you are the temple. And God's going to come back for a temple full of glory. I believe there's a place in the last days where the priest won't be able to stand and minister because of the weight of the glory of God manifest in his temple. Boom. Just some quick thoughts for you guys today. I uh, hope to see some of you in Europe this week, uh, coming week and weekend, and uh, be blessed wherever you are at. Drop me a line and check out, I have two new videos coming out today, part of my Freedom Series and part of my q and I'll be doing a live Q&A tomorrow, all on the subject of grace and favor. Going to be good. <laughs> Love you guys. See you soon in the plan. Bye for now.